So international organizations are a really interesting bit of international politics. Much of international politics happens within international organizations. And I'm sure that when you think of international relations, then pictures of, you know, the UN or the General Assembly fly around in your head because that tends to be what people associate with decision making and politics at the international level. But first, let's think about how we actually get here. So if we think about the usual way that so far we've mostly thought about politics, it was about national governments in what we call anarchy. So this is your Algeria's, your Seychelles, your Kyrgyzstan's or your Sri, Lanka, Sri Lanka's, which act, um, which set their own policies and which interact with others at the global level. So that could be one way uh, how we understand what's going on on the international level. It's basically just states interacting with other states and kind of uh, interacting and pushing away like billiard balls on a table effectively. Anarchy in this sense means not chaos, but the absence of a legitimate overarching um, force. So in a state, you're, you're not in anarchy because you have uh, a government with a police force and rules and laws and other things you have to follow that ensures that you can't just do what you want, you have to follow the rules. But that kind of thing doesn't exist at the international level. Um, states can basically do whatever they want. They can even wage war against each other if they want, um, and no a global policeman is there to stop them. So that'd be one way of thinking about international politics, you know, is this just national governments uh, interacting in anarchy? And then the other bit of how international politics could possibly work at the extreme other end of the spectrum is if we put our tinfoil hats on and we think that there is maybe a world government um, acting on us occasionally, you know, if you watch too much Alex Jones or something, you'll probably uh, think that too, that there is a an overarching organization at the global level that determines what happens in nation states. But of course, much like the flag of the United Federation of Planets, this is a fiction. There is no world government. Instead, what there is, is there is an intermediate level between just the atomized individual states and a world government, and that is the level of international governance, and that is, of course, exactly what we'll look at today. International governance in the form of mostly international organizations like the UN, the World Trade Organization, ASEAN, or the International Criminal Court. We'll come to all of these later on in the lecture. So because I've now already thrown out quite a bit of nomenclature, um, let's sort through what different types of politics actually mean. So let's see, let's start with one state. Okay, we call this state A. State A has, like all good states, a government, and it also will have interest groups inside of it. This can be parties, unions, uh, this can be environmental action groups, human rights groups, um, you know, employers, lobbies, whatever you can think of, right? Just anything that is not a government. Now, of course, in the international system, we don't just have one state, we have many states. And the simplest way these states could interact is by doing something we call transgovernmental politics, because it means that the governments of those states are interacting and negotiating. So whenever you have an international summit and, you know, someone like Joe Biden meets someone like Boris Johnson meets someone like Angela Merkel, um, these kind of negotiations are transgovernmental because there's governments, executives interacting with each other to negotiate. You could, of course, also have the other societal groups inside of a state interact with each other. And this is, tends to be what we call transnational politics. Transnational politics happens when you have interest groups inside of states that are not the government interacting across borders. Now, those could be friendly interactions. You know, if Greenpeace UK wants to interact or coordinate with Greenpeace France, they're not going through the British and French governments. They just coordinate with each other. So they could be friendly relations or they can be antagonistic. Think of international human rights groups, for example, exerting pressure on multinational corporations to change their uh, labor laws, for example, or the ways in which they pollute the environment. So this is transnational politics and the separation from transgovernmental politics. Now, I've already shown you, though, in the previous slide that, of course, there is international and regional organizations. So what do we call that then? Um, well, when states, multiple states, 
interact with international organizations or inside of international organizations, we call this supranational politics. Supra because it's on top of national politics. Um, and this is whenever this happens in an institutionalized framework. But of course, much like there is not just one state in the world, there's also more than one international organization in the world. And then you could have a fourth level of politics where international organizations themselves are interacting. Remember that, for example, the EU sends um, observers to the UN. So this is one international organization, one IO, uh, interacting in another IO. And we tend to call this multinational politics. All these labels are a tiny bit negotiable. Not everyone uses these in the same time, but I find them helpful just to separate these different levels and to be more precise about what we talk about. So you might be asking, well, I've said international organization or IO already 20 odd times. So what is actually an IO? What are we looking at when we say an international organization? Well, a useful and often cited definition comes from Barnett and Finnemore from 2004, and they simply say, well, an IO is anything that has three or more state members. Note the word state here, that's an important operator. Three or more state members, so just two states bilaterally, that's not an organization yet. It needs to have some kind of permanent secretariat, so it needs to be, it needs to have people that are employed by the organization rather than just by, say, the member states. It has to have some sort of formalized structure. So it can't just be, say, a series of ad hoc meetings, like, hey, let's meet next Tuesday, we have something to discuss. There needs to be a formalized structure, there needs to be um, a certain set of rules that govern how decisions are made, or how people are appointed, or how members join or leave the organization. It performs ongoing tasks, so it can't just have, you know, a, a task with a with a fixed duration, for example. We want to eliminate pollution in this river, and after that it's over. There has to be some ongoing work to be done here that can also change over time. And there has to be a common purpose, so there has to be a defined goal of that organization. Um, rather than just saying, wouldn't it be nice, lads, if you all got together every week. Normally, these IOs are created by multilateral, multilateral agreements. So that's just a fancy word of saying international treaty. So these treaties are signed by state representatives normally, and they then create an IO for a specific purpose with a secretariat and a formalized structure. Nowadays, the almost more common way of creating a new IO is as a spin-off of an existing IO. So imagine an IO like the United Nations creating new organizations by just saying, hey, there shall now be an organization called UN Women that deals with issues of gender equality both within and without the UN. So this is a kind of a couple of the basic criteria for how um, what an IO really is. Now, let's remember, though, uh, importantly, not all international governance, so not all rules that are being made at the international level, are also an international organization. You can find tons and tons of bilateral treaties, for example, between countries that are not international organizations because with the signing of the treaty, that's all that ever happens. They don't continue to meet. If you just want to have an, a simple trade agreement with another state, then all you have to do is sign the treaty, say there is no tariffs, there is no trade barriers, and then move on with your lives. No need to have anyone... Um, uh, as the secretariat of the treaty, for example. So there is more international governance that there is international organization, but oftentimes international governance and international cooperation evolves into international organizations because it turns out that most things are better negotiated on an ongoing basis rather than always just ad hoc in the moment as it comes up, basically. Now, quantitatively, IOs are not a new concept, okay? You see here a little graph that shows you the rough number of international organizations defined in some specific way over time, and you see this starts all the way back in 1850. Um, we see very few international organizations throughout the 19th century, but not none, and then we see a sharp increase after the Second World War with numbers uh, quadrupling, basically, in a matter of about 40 years. Uh, 
This uh, chart also, interestingly enough, uh, lists how many IOs were birthed and how many died. So, of course, the IO population is not stable. Sometimes IOs just go away. Um, but overall, the number has increased. Depending on how you count this, by the way, you sometimes find numbers that are way, way, way higher than this in the tens of thousands. Kind of depends on your definition of what an IO is. This is a fairly conservative one, and it says we have about 350 in the system today. The really, really old ones are actually really interesting because we do have a few organizations that have now been around for over 200 years, which is a crazy number if you think about that. I mean, that was back in the days before the railway, basically. And things like the Central Commission for Navigation on the Rhine, the oldest I.O., it's a fun fact for very boring parties. The oldest I.O. is still in operation. I think it sits in Basel or somewhere, um, and it still makes rules and oversees how ships navigate on the Rhine because, of course, the Rhine flows through several countries, so there was a need to coordinate. But also things like the Universal Postal Union have been around for a long time. Think about how magical it is that you put a little stamp on a letter, and even if you sent that off to... Canada or Pakistan or Singapore, the local postal organization just accepts that you've paid and they deliver your stuff, even though it costs them money. Kind of a crazy thing, a tiny bit of magic, and it's been around for over 150 years. The International Telecommunications Union and the International Labor Organization have also been around for a long time, and they are quite... Um, uh, significant. They've done a lot of things. They've created a lot of rules. The International Telecommunications Union started as the International Telegraph Union, and now it coordinates many, many more things, including modern telecom infrastructure. So they've been around for a good long while. The other important bit to remember about international organizations is that when most experts use the word I.O., they tend to mean intergovernmental organizations. So they tend to mean organizations whose members are individual states. So, you know, Singapore or Germany or Sweden would be a member of that organization. There is another class of international organizations called INGOs, so international non-governmental organizations, but these normally tend to get less attention um, because while they can control a good amount of funding, for example, or do other very important things, they tend to not make rules that are binding on member states, and therefore we political scientists look at them comparatively more rarely. But these are, of course, a lot of organizations that you're very familiar with out of your daily life, you know, everything from Greenpeace to IESEC, the academic organization, to the International Olympic Committee, Human Rights Watch, the Mercy Corps, or Médecins Sans Frontières, um, so Doctors Without Borders. So we're not talking about those this um, at lecture because much like most of the other literature I am taking the approach that the international governmental organizations are the more consequential and therefore more worthy of our attention. We can fight about that if you want to. Now let's take a step back though. We've learned that there is a rise in the number of international organizations and they're also doing ever more things over the past 200 years so let's think a little more fundamentally about why that is the case. Why do we create international organizations? Where do IOs come from? Well, my core argument would be that mm, this is based on interdependence. So interdependence as a concept can mean two different things. Interdependence as a, at a more basic level can just mean connectivity. So it means that states are increasingly interconnected. So, you know, both in terms of trade, but also in terms of uh, telecommunications infrastructure, in terms of travel, tourism, socially, culturally, through people moving and migration. There's just more and more connections between states than there used to be. That doesn't mean there was none before, but quantitatively and qualitatively, interdependence in this sense has increased quite a lot. But the more interesting bit of interdependence is actually when interdependence truly means interdependence. So when there is a dependency between actors. And we always talk about independence, uh, interdependence when there is a relationship between two actors where these interconnections can incur costs. It is costly to be dependent on someone else, or it can be potentially costly to depend on someone else. Imagine you are a country that uh, produces a lot of semiconductors, 
you are very high tech, but that also normally means that you are not also the country where the resources to make those semiconductors are mined. For that, you need other countries. Oftentimes those countries can be quite poor, but you don't really have any choice but buy the resources from them because you don't have them yourself. Those situations create dependencies. Oftentimes these dependencies are mutual. Yes, you need the resources from the country, but that country also needs you to pay for those resources because they want to make money. And whenever you would try to sever those interconnections, you try to uh, do away with them, eliminate them, that would normally mean uh, you have high costs. So whenever you have those situations where there's an interdependence and your actions have consequences for me, but also the other way around, these mutual dependencies, then we can say this is the, the deeper meaning of interdependence in the global sense. And the idea here is that over the past centuries, the degree it to which and the fields in which states have become interdependent of each other has increased ever more. Now, to think about this a little more um, systematically, mm. oh, I forgot to point at the hilarious um, ship, of course, that got stuck in the Suez Canal last year, where we all made, wait, was this last year or was it this year? Time is a soup. Anyway, uh, we were all making jokes, you know, how this stupid thing gets stuck and then you don't get your new graphics card delivered um, uh, that's made in Taiwan or China. So, um, okay, let's think about this a little more systematically though, right? What happens in those situations where the actors, where the actions of two actors have consequences for each other? This tends to be dealt with by a specific um, subset of of uh, political and economic theory <clears throat> that is called game theory. Game theory systematically describes situations mostly of two actors interacting and it thinks about the risks and the payoffs involved in different actions and tries to come up with systematic predictions about what actors do in certain situations. Okay, so what does that have to do with IOs? Well, let's take an example real quick. Imagine there's a game being played by two players. Imagine you and me are playing a game, okay? You're player one, I'm player two. We both have a card each to reach, uh, to, to, um, to hold up. We have a blue card and a red card. Now, um, someone else counts down from three and by the time the count reaches zero, then we both hold up a card of our choice. And depending on which cards we both hold up, there is specific outcomes associated with that. So there is a, first off, a pot of two cookies that we're playing for. Now, depending on how we hold up our cards, these cookies are split up in different ways. So if we're both holding up the blue card, which is the nice card, if we're both holding up the blue cards, then we both get eat one cookie each. So we split the pot when we hold up one card. Now, if we both hold up the red card, which is the not so nice card, then nobody gets a cookie and the guy that counted down actually gets the cookies. So we get zero cookies. The interesting part happens when one of us holds up a blue card is being nice and one of us holds up a red card and is being evil. So the person that held up the blue card then gets nothing and the person that held up the mean card gets everything. And this is what these situations describe, right? If my decision as player two means I hold up red and your decision as player one was blue, then we look at this intersection of our actions and we can see that I get two cookies in this particular uh, instance. Now, you could think about what you think would be the optimal strategy. What would be the optimal thing to do in this kind of a situation, right? You have seen all the outcomes. They're not terribly complex. So if we actually did play this, and in normal years, I do play this with candy in the lecture hall, which always is the source of great hilarity. Um, what would you play? Um, if I put you back to back with someone else and you had to hold up a card, what would you do? Would you hold up blue and try to get one cookie? Or would you maybe not hold up blue and hold up red because you're a little bit afraid that you might hold up blue but the other one doesn't? Well, it turns out that this is a situation of interdependence that of course is quite famous in game theory and you probably have already figured this out um, because what this is, is it's the prisoner's dilemma. If we systematize this a tiny bit, 
game theory always uses numbers to designate which fields we particularly like. So instead of blue and red, we're now using the words cooperate and defect, but it's the same situation effectively. I'm still player two, you still player one. The way that game theory fills out this particular box is that the higher the number, the more you like the field that that number is in. The first number in each field is always for you as player one. The second number in each field is for me, player two in each field. So if we look at the cooperative outcome, we both held up the nice card. We see that this is three for you, so pretty high, three out of four for you and three out of four for me. But hold on, you might say, why is this three out of four and not four out of four? Well, because there's two cookies at stake, okay? And you could get more than one cookie because if you picked correctly, if you picked the red card and I picked the blue card, then you get two cookies and I get zero. That for you is a better outcome than splitting the pot with me. So that's why you give a four to this field and a three to this field. What's the third best outcome? Well, the third best outcome could be that we both don't get a cookie. Now, hold on, you might say, you know, wait, if you, if we both hold up red and we get no cookie, why is that better than if you held up blue and I held up red? Because in both cases, you don't get a cookie, right? So shouldn't these fields have the same value for you? Because both down here and down here, you get no cookie at the end. Well, it turns out that you dislike this field even more because that means not only did you not get a cookie, I also got them. So this is the sucker's field up here for you. You hate this. This is like losing a Monopoly game against your little brother. Um, this You dislike having no cookies more if the other actor actually did get the pot than if both of them got nothing. Now, again, you could think about what your strategy should be here. What should you play if you play this with someone else, right? probably the same thing as before, right? The situation hasn't changed. So again, what would your strategy be here? It's a bit of a question, right? Well, I would argue that your best strategy, at least say game theorists, is to always defect, to always hold up the red card. Why is that? Well, that's true. If you hold up the red card, you occasionally get the outcome that both of you get no cookie but you also occasionally get the outcome where you get two cookies and the other one gets none, which is great, right? And you never get the outcome where you hold up blue and the other one holds up red and you get nothing and the other one gets everything. So always holding up the red card is the uh, individually optimal strategy because you ensure that there is situations where you get two cookies if you hold up the blue card, you can never get two cookies. You only get a maximum of one. And it minimizes the situations where you could get no cookies and the other person could get two. So there's an individually optimal strategy that says you should always defect. Now, here's the problem. Both players think this at the same time. And if both players think this at the same time, they will always end up in this field down here with no cookies forever instead of, because they thought they were so smart, instead of occasionally getting two cookies also, right? Because they both have the same thought. So what does that mean then? Well, it means that even in a situation where both players want to cooperate, they tend to be tempted by the higher payoffs of unilateral defection. So even if you think like cooperation is nice, you might still be tempted because if you occasionally hold up the red card, you can get two cookies instead of just one. And it's a dilemma because what it means is both players individually choose the optimal strategy. But collectively, that means they are getting a suboptimal payoff. Because of course, if, the, if both actors think that holding up the red card is always optimal, they could play this game a thousand times, and after a thousand times, they will have ended up with zero cookies. While players that do cooperate and hold up the cooperation card a thousand times would get a thousand cookies. So something that is individually optimal is collectively suboptimal, and that's the dilemma. Now, why am I telling you this long-ass story about a prisoner's dilemma and cookies and all this stuff? Well, it turns out that game theorists and international relations scholars say there is a lot of prisoners type situations, prisoners dilemma type situations 
everywhere in international politics. So things like an arms race or a prisoner's dilemma, because ideally you would both not spend any money on arms. But you can't really trust the other person to not be mean. Being mean in this case means they promise that they won't get nukes, but secretly they still get nukes. And then they can nuke you without you being able to retaliate because you've been nice this whole time. So you end up in a situation where both countries arm themselves to the teeth, even though that doesn't really get them anywhere. They're just where they started, with equal armaments on both sides. That's how an arms race works. So if they could work together, they could lower their spending and be just as secure. But because they can't, they, they want the higher payoff from unilateral defection. That means that they tend to get in situations where they spend and spend and spend and spend on something they wouldn't actually need, which is the collectively suboptimal outcome. And we're not even going to talk about the fact that there's like tens of thousands of nukes lying around, right? We're only talking about money. So um, game theorists say in any prisoner's dilemma type situation, this outcome is inevitable. Okay, if you only play this game once, everyone will hold up the red card and everyone will end up in the non-cooperative outcome where no one really gets anything. And this type of situation is really common. It's, you know, arms races I've already mentioned, but also uh, land disputes, for example. Um, you know, only one person can own a, a certain bit of land. No two states can share land or something like overfishing, right? It'd be great if we all um, were restrained in how we used fish, but we also don't quite trust the other party that if we hold back on fishing, that the other guy just pulls out even more. Right, So it ends up in a situation where everyone pulls out everything that they can, which of course is a terrible idea and leads to overfishing and everyone ending up with no fish in the end. If only we could work together, then everything would be solved. So these situations are everywhere and this outcome is inevitable, say game theorists. Now, if this outcome is inevitable, if situations of this kind of interdependence are um, bad, how do we get from there to stable cooperation? So it's clear that it would be a better idea for everyone if we just continued to cooperate instead of continuing to betray each other. That would be the far, far better outcome. So how do we get from interdependence to stable cooperation? Well, the one way could be to just say we organize this on the principle of reciprocity. This is also sometimes called tit for tat, and it basically just means we start cooperating, and whenever I catch you betraying me, I will betray you in the next round. So you know that there's repercussions for you not um, cooperating with me. That can, of course, only work if we play multiple times. But of course, states interact all the time. They don't just you know, make a treaty or trade one barrel of fish and then they do that never again. They trade all the time. So the repetition of the game could lead to stable cooperation because we basically just say we make a promise that we cooperate and if we break that promise there is ways to retaliate. Great because it's very low cost, right? You have to do almost nothing for that, um, but it's also of course fairly temporary and it's not very um, solid, right? You, you, don't, you don't really have a ton of anticipation that this would just continue forever. There could well be breaks in that cooperation if all you have is a promise. So, say... IR scholars, the better way of organizing this, arguably the better way of organizing this, is to institutionalize the interaction. So to create institutions in which we interact, to give ourselves rules of interaction, and to clearly define what cooperation means and what happens if you don't cooperate, and to therefore um, create costs to your non-cooperation. So if we... Uh, create an organization that allows us to repeatedly interact and that defines what happens if we don't, that then leads to a rule-based stable cooperation, which is great because it tends to be permanent and formalized, but also has quite high costs because we have to create, say, a secretariat that monitors whether both states that are part of that agreement actually respect the rules. So, okay, that's how you get from interdependence to stable cooperation. You have situations, uh, prisoner's dilemma type situations, and um, these will sometimes entail cooperation if you manage to institutionalize that um, interaction. Okay, so whether or not states create international organizations is also dependent on one other thing, and that is 
how compatible their interests are. So it's not just dependent on the situation, but also on the interests. If there's a harmony of interests, so if both sides actually want the same thing, then you don't really need institutions because it's pretty clear that you know both sides want the same thing, so why would you need to create a rule for that, right? If both sides want to liberalize their trade, there's no need for an organization because you just do away with those trade barriers. On the other hand, if you have a conflict without any common interests, so for example, two states want the same bit of land, you can't share it, you can't timeshare like a slice of your land, only one state can own it, then institutions are also unlikely because how are you going to find the compromise there, right? Imagine there's a car in front of your house and some guy walks up to you and goes, that's my car now. What's the compromise there? No, it's mine. No, it's yours. No, it's mine. No, it's yours. The compromise can't be that it belongs a little bit to you and a little bit to the other person. It has to belong to one. It's only in situations with some conflict, but also with some common interests that we'll find institutions. So there are problems that we need to solve and we have interests in common, um, and then we need institutions to sort out these conflicts because we already know that there is maybe some sort of overlap between us or a compromise that could be found. And whether or not we then set up institutions depends a little bit on the costs and benefits of this and a couple of other factors. So let's look at a couple of big debates about international organizations in the research and the scholarship. We now know that states create international organizations for specific purposes. So let's look at a couple of them and see if we can get a better grasp on what is problematic about them. I think that's always a good way of starting. So first we'll ask, are IOs merely arenas or are they actors in their own right? And we'll look at the UN as an example. We'll then think about whether states are really the only relevant actors when we think about international organization because I've already talked to you about INGOs, but it's not about that. This is about organizations that integrate non-state actors in their decision-making alongside state actors. And we look at the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria for that. Does the world follow a dominant Western model? So are we, by investigating international organizations, not again furthering this narrative that there is a Western way of doing things that has been exported around the world? And we look at ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, to look at this question. If you're a critical thinker, you might have thought, you know, is this not another episode in the long series of global structures of inequality? Um, do IOs maybe mirror this? You know, powerful states in the world just determine how international organizations work. They can tell others what to do. And this really just reinforces the inequalities and inequities that we have in the world. And we look at the International Monetary Fund for this. And then lastly, a very basic question, but still a very, very relevant one, how much power do IOs really have? And we look at the International Criminal Court for that. Okay, here we go, first one. Let's look at the UN first. You've all heard of the United Nations, it needs no introduction, right? But the question that we're trying to illustrate with the case of the UN is whether IOs are merely arenas for states to interact in, or are they actors in their own right? Do IOs ever do anything on their own, by themselves? Or is it always just states acting through them? So a couple of basic facts about the UN that you might or might not know. Of course, it was founded in 1945, so it's 76 years old. It was very much an initiative of the victorious powers of World War II, and it came out of the earlier League of Nations, that was an attempt at doing exactly the same thing after the First World War. Didn't work because we had a Second World War, so they tried again and called it the United Nations. There's a couple of rather famous main organs. You will know the General Assembly. That's the big room, the greenish room with a golden logo in the back, where you sometimes see heads of state give speeches, the GA. The Security Council, which is the one that's in the news most often uh, because it meets the most and it has... Um, uh, wide-ranging decision-making powers. We also have the Economic and Social Council that is basically doing the same thing as the Security Council does, just not in the area of security. And we have the International Court of Justice, which is a court to which states can take their disputes to have them settled uh, at the UN level. It is effectively permanently in session. The GA, of course, only meets once a year around October. So this was just passed a couple of, of weeks. 
Um, but things like the Security Council are permanently in session, and of course, many of its sub organs, its bodies, and its bureau bureaucrats that work in this UN building in New York City uh, are permanently there and are working all the time. The primary purposes of the UN are preserving international peace and security. That's you know, quite the charge, and they should enable cooperation between all peace-loving states. That's a lovely way of how this is put in the UN Charter, is it says that members can be all peace-loving states. Not if you're a warmonger, you can't get in here. The principles are um, few, but rightly famous, because they have a, a couple of important implications. There is first the principle of sovereign equality. So in the General Assembly, for example, every state has exactly one vote, all the way from, you know, states like Tuvalu in the Pacific with 10,000 people, all the way to a state like China with uh, a population of over a billion. Um, the non-interference in domestic affairs is another uh, important uh, part of how the UN works. So the principle is that the UN is really only there to negotiate over and decide on international matters, so things that happen between states, anything that goes on domestically, something that only happens inside your state, how you set up your welfare system, who you put into prison for the most part, how you make your laws, all this other stuff, that is not the business of the UN. That is your domestic right to settle certain issues. And you can already see that this might lead to a couple of problems. Decisions at the UN are mainly made through the medium of resolutions, uh, and they can be either binding, those are Security Council resolutions, so those are, have the power of law and states have to respect them, or there are sanctions, or they can be non-binding. Don't know if you knew that, but the General Assembly resolutions that they published a great fanfare are actually about as heavy as a strongly worded letter. They're not legally binding. States can choose to ignore these resolutions, so the UN is predicated on states respecting GA resolutions voluntarily. Now, there tends to be two different arguments here on the question of whether the UN is an arena or an actor in its own right. So the first argument is that the UN is really nothing more than a convenient negotiating space. So it's just a convenient place for states to meet and to create these situations that I talked about earlier where you continuously interact and therefore you choose to cooperate rather than choosing the mean option all the time and therefore making everyone worse off. But that argument goes on to say, well, because it's only a negotiating space, because the states retain all the decision-making power, that means that the UN never really does anything. Like, you know, the UN can't turn up at your, at your, um, at your house and tell you to do certain things. It is always going to be the member states that enact those resolutions and that put those decisions into force that are taken at the UN level. Because the UN itself, of course, has no real coercive power. The UN can't just, you know, um, uh, take stuff out of your bank account or send the military or the police after a certain state. So this is the arena view of the UN. Now, there is another argument, of course. There's the argument that the UN is very much more than the sum of its parts. So the UN is more than just a space in which space, uh, states come together and make decisions. So for one... The bureaucrats that work for the UN, and especially its most visible bureaucrat, the Secretary General, can really shape debates. If the Secretary General of the UN gets on a podium and says, this is a really important problem that we need to discuss, it's actually rather hard for states to ignore that because um, there is such power in this one person speaking for the organization and for the world a little bit. There's also, though, a more deeper way in which the UN might affect decision-making in that states are socialized into the organization's rules. So socialized much like you are socialized into standards of appropriate behavior in society, you know, like don't um, blow your nose at someone in public, don't um, eat with your mouth open, you know, Hold elevators door, elevator doors open for people. Queue properly, you know. Don't stare at people in public. Lots and lots of ways in which we do things that are appropriate, even though there's no law against staring at someone, right? We still do it. That's socialization. 
an argument too that says no the un can be an, an actor in its own right it says that well the un is really the thing that socializes states to do certain things and not do other things and can therefore exert quite a lot of power the fact that you are a state in the un interacting continuously with un bureaucrats but also with other states uh, first and foremost means that you're not acting the same way as if you weren't part of that organization so I guess fundamentally, for the case of the UN, we could ask, you know, who is responsible for a certain outcome? If, um, you know, we compare IOs to football teams, if Scotland does poorly in, the quali in another round of qualifications, who do we blame for the loss? Do we blame the players that are on the pitch? Goes of the states? Or do we blame Scotland, the national team, as an institution? And maybe it's coaches or it's managers or something. Do we blame those for a loss? Do we blame both a little bit? Or who's more responsible, right? Think of this analogy as a football team. What would you subscribe to? It's mostly about the players. Then you're in argument one. It's an arena. It's mostly the structures around them. Then you're in argument two. And it's the environment. And the UN can be an actor in its own right. So uh, let's look at the next uh, institution to drive home another a kind of important point and that is which actors are really the relevant ones when it comes to international organization and international cooperation so we'll look at the global fund here this is another high-rise building i have like four different high-rise buildings here because they all look the same so this is the global fund in geneva this is uh, the long version of its name is called the global fund to fight aids tuberculosis and malaria so three infectious diseases it's fairly recent it's only about two decades old so well, probably older than most of you guys are, but still, that's a fairly young international organization, right? It hasn't been around for hundreds of years, like some of the others. It has, uh, in those 20 years, uh, collected and dispersed around $50 billion in the fight against these infectious diseases. So that's quite a bit of money, right? That's not nothing. That's uh, more than the GDP of many small countries. Um, certainly the... the, the oh, oh, the yearly GDP, if not even the GDP over that entire time span. About 90% of those funds come from states, but a significant amount um, comes from private donors. You can actually donate to the Global Fund. Or if you've ever bought anything that had the product red label attached to it, I think Body Shop has it, like Apple used to sell product red items, then any product red branded item gives its proceeds, its profits to the Global Fund, actually. The way that the Global Fund works is, well, it sits in Geneva in this building. It raises money from member states and other donors, including private ones. Countries can then apply for that money. The experts from the Global Fund evaluate these applications and the board of the Global Fund then approves this looks a little bit like you were if you were to apply for a scholarship or if you know us academics apply for grants the global fund is innovative in a number of ways so the first is it has a really narrow mandate i mean you know these three um illnesses look almost a bit random um but they are of course some of the biggest killers in the developing world uh, so it has a really narrow mandate only focused on these three diseases it's only funding rather than implementing. So there's never any global fund personnel in the country that gets the money. The country just applies for the grant. The global fund gives it the money and then it just monitors what happens with it. And it's up to you as the applicant state to make that money work. Of course, if you do a poor job, then the global fund isn't going to give you any more money later on. So you have an interest in keeping the money flowing. It's also innovative in that non-state actors actually have votes in this global international organization. So how does this look like? Well, decision-making has non-state actors integrated in two main ways. So the first is as experts, that's maybe the less controversial way, but the second one is as board members. So experts evaluate these proposals. So imagine this is basically academics, right? People that are trained in global health or health economists, development econom uh, economists that are evaluating these applications in a depoliticized process. So these are not, you know, state representatives that are making these decisions. These are just experts that are evaluating applications on their merits, on their scientific and economic merits. 
the Global Fund board that makes decisions, that then approves whether or not you get the money, has donor representatives, and those are the usual suspects. You know, countries like Japan, Germany, or the US send state representatives there. But also, crucially, there, there are 10 implementer representatives as voting members. And that sometimes means implementing countries. So developing countries actually are part of this the decision making. But more interestingly, non-state actors are also decision makers here. So the US, for example, gets one vote on the board to decide whether a country gets money. But an organization like the Global Action for Trans Equality also gets one vote, which is almost unprecedented in international affairs. I've just given you a couple of the organizations that currently have voting rights here on par with giant donor countries like the US or Japan. The Interagency Coalition on AIDS and Development is from Canada. The Gates Foundation, of course, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Don't know if they changed the name now. Anyway, that thing is also a part of it and used to be its main sponsor in the beginning or one of its first sponsors. Goodbye Malaria is a South African NGO. So, and these change all the time, but they always have equal voting rights. So this is really interesting, right? Is this maybe the beginnings of a trend here in that non-state actors might become more involved in decision-making at the global level and might, be, might get rights on, on equal footing with states? So more fundamentally, we could ask, you know, which situations might create a uh, propensity by states to accept other uh, actors as decision makers. So another really important uh, discussion around international organizations, is it fair to really only look at state-based organizations or is it becoming a trend that non-state actors are integrated here? Okay, case number three. Um, does the world follow a dominant Western model? So is, you know, the story of international organizations really just a case, maybe like international trade, where you have a dominant Western model that gets exported everywhere and just gets basically a bit of neocolonialism in a sense. Western countries are the richest countries in the world and they come in and they say, this is how international organization works. And so therefore you have to follow our model. That is a reasonable expectation to have because it does happen in other issue areas. Sorry, I have to pick up my cat real quick. Give me a cat. Oh, oh, so big. Okay, now ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, was founded in 1967. Uh, its charter was signed in 2007, so it's really only come into its own in the past sort of 15 years. It is 10 members in Southeast Asia that I'm going to try to rattle off here as a bit of a a, a, a feat of memory here. So this is uh, Myanmar, uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Brunei, and the Philippines. Hey, I did it. Um, so and the membership has been stable since 1999. So for the past 20 years, ASEAN has had the same members. They're headquartered in Jakarta. You see the building here on the right. And it has its own symbol, which is kind of cool. This looks the sheath sheath whatever like it's it's a, like a yellow symbol on a red ground that's also on the official ASEAN flag and ASEAN even has its own anthem that includes the immortal line we dare to dream we care to share to gather for ASEAN uh, check out the YouTube video there's a minute long video from ASEAN on its anthem it has a couple of main organs mostly the ASEAN summit is its core decision making organ which happens twice a year. There's also a coordinating council and then three separate councils on security matters, on economic matters, and on social and cultural issues. Overall, ASEAN has a really light institutional structure. It has a fairly small secretariat, and most of the decisions are taken on these twice yearly um, summits of the heads of state and government that come together and the secretariat is really only there to more or less prepare things for these summits. The main aim of the organization of ASEAN is economic integration, has been the case all the way from the beginning. The end goal is a common market and a monetary union, uh, much like uh, in the European Union, of course. Now, why it's interesting to think about ASEAN as an organization here, as a regional organization, is that Asia, in contrast to other world regions like Africa, like Europe, or like Latin America, Asia lacks a pan-Asian movement. There's a pan-African movement, for example, that 
aims to, you know, bring the continent together as a collection of like-minded states. Similar things haven't ever existed in Asia, certainly not on a level more than the, the, the very smallest one. Um, so ASEAN began similarly to integration initiatives in other areas, focused on trade, something like EFTA or NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Association and the European Free Trade Association. But in contrast to other world regions, especially Europe, the spillover effects have been minimal. So this has, even though the organization has existed for over 60 years, not really led to very much very deep integration. Still, the organization is strictly intergovernmental. So this all happens through summits. There's no thing like in the European Union where m much power has been delegated to the EU level um, rather than retained at the national level. And the ways in which uh, power is delegated to ASEAN is very limited. In fact, a respect for sovereignty is like the dominant organizing principle for how ASEAN conducts its uh, business. It's really respecting individual states' sovereignties before everything else. So, in other words, a non-interference, non-intervention in domestic affairs for these states is much more important than further integration at the regional level. In fact, this has been called the ASEAN way by ASEAN itself and by observers in that um, there shall be no, no uh, intervention in any domestic affairs, that most things are conducted in an informal sort of institutionalism. So everything is very soft. The negotiations have to happen through consensus. There is no strongly worded statements or, you know, um, wagging fingers by the organization towards its members. So we see here an organization that works very, very differently from something like the European Union, where much power has been given to the organization. Here we see an organization that's really a, a light touch structure and that doesn't really impose a lot of what we call sovereignty costs on its members. So not all regional integration follows the EU model and certainly not all international organizations follow a specific Western model of how to organize things. So we could ask, of course, then, if we take this into account, how diverse is the institutional universe, really, that we're dealing with here? Okay, next, let's talk about global inequality. Okay, you could be um, forgiven for thinking that, um, you know, in a world that is clearly structured on, you know, the idea of capitalism, a global capitalist division of labor, and a world in which you have stark inequalities between the global north and the global south, for example, or between um, the uh, developed world and the developing world, do IOs not just mirror these global structures of inequality? So are they not just an expression of the world being structured in a way that um, prioritizes and um, the needs and interests of the global wealthy North. Well, the case in point here is the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. What is the IMF? Well, the IMF sits in Washington in another high rise with uh, shiny uh, windows. It was founded in 1945, so a rather old organization, just as old as the UN, as part of the Bretton Woods system. It's called that way because it was a conference in a town called Bretton Woods in the US as part of a global monetary order. So states came together to uh, eliminate or reduce the risk of another global economic crisis, similar to the one that we'd seen between the two world wars. And the IMF was designed to work much like a normal bank, to which uh, countries in financial difficulties could go, much like you, if you can't pay your bills, or if you are short of money to buy something, you go to the bank and you borrow funds, which you later then repay. The IMF works much the same way. I should be a little more precise because there's also the World Bank, which does a similar thing. The IMF really only steps in if your financial system, your currency system, is really under stress and you need international help for your, interna for your uh, monetary system to not fall apart. So the IMF will give you funds. It will give you a loan that you have to repay over a number of years under certain conditions. As of 2021, the IMF can give out a total of one trillion dollars, okay, one million billion dollars to any state that applies for money. 
So a number that's almost unimaginably large, right? Um, and this works through something called special drawing rights. So the IMF, of course, isn't sitting on a giant pile of gold worth $1 trillion. It can effectively just draw on the reserves of its member states. But it's a complicated process, and I'm not going to get into that in detail. Why does it have so much money lying around, the $1 trillion? Well, because it has almost universal membership. 190 countries around the world are members of the IMF, and it currently, as of 2021, has 29 ongoing loans to different countries around the world. Its main organs are a board of governors, that's all its member states, that technically holds ultimate power, but really in reality, it's devolved most of its decision-making power to the executive board that only has a certain number of uh, member states sitting on it. And there's a managing director that tends to be a, a quite a prominent um, European person. It used to be Christine Lagarde uh, until a, a little while ago, and it's currently a Bulgarian economist. And I forgot her name, but you, you're going to be able to, to look her up. So what are the points of contention then with an organization like that? Surely it's a good idea to have an international organization that is tasked with um, stabilizing the global financial system. Well, it turns out there's actually quite a few points of contention here. So the first is, of course, that the executive board, so the thing that actually makes the decisions on who gets the loans and at what conditions is dominated by the wealthy global north. So voting power isn't equally distributed. So I think the executive board has 28 members or something, and the voting power isn't one member, one vote. It is actually proportional to your economic power, i.e. to the amount of money that the IMF can draw on from you as a member state. So clearly, who's the largest there? The US. Second, I think, is Japan. And there's a couple of other uh, really large uh, industrialized uh, economies in there and the only um, non the only countries that we would probably consider to be at least developing countries are China India and Brazil which of course Oliver has talked about talked about before and the US alone has twice as much voting weight as this second country down the list which is Japan um, it's actually quite a quite a funny voting system where you have like you can have hundreds of thousands of votes and then the votes are so the US has like 830,000 votes and then the votes of all those in favor of a particular decision are tallied up. So that's the first bit, right? The, the organization is uh, very much um, uh, designed to uh, give primacy to the wealthy global north. The second point of contention is conditionality. So the, the IMF, of course, doesn't just have to give you a loan. It can impose conditions of you, on you, and the conditions normally include financial reform. So they can tell you as a state, you are broke, your financial system is about to collapse, your currency is worthless, you go to the Global Fund for some help, and the Global Fund says, sure, I'll give you money under the following conditions. You have to commit to a strong uh, program of budgetary reform and austerity. So for the longest part of the IMF's history, austerity was actually one of the main conditions imposed on states that are that were trying to access the IMF's money. And uh, the economist Jeffrey Sachs has also called austerity uh, belt tightening for countries too poor to own belts. So, of course, you're already in fairly dire straits and you don't really have much money to go around. So then if the IMF um, imposes conditions on you to further reduce uh, state expenditures, that can lead to some quite fi significant financial problems, uh, can lead to some quite significant societal problems for you. And the IMF has often been charged with advancing a, pr a particular dominant neoliberal economic model of how the global economy should be structured. Of course, it's capitalist. That's what it works. But also uh, a limited uh, amount of state interaction, uh, a limited amount of state intervention in domestic affairs, a limited amount of state spending. Um, and all of these tended to be part of the conditions for you receiving a loan. Um, there's a couple of other points that the IMF sometimes gets charged with. You know, implementation is actually none of the IMF's business. They just give you the money and then they leave it entirely up to you of what you do with your programs and what you do domestically to make that happen. 
and they have a very narrow mission. They only care about your financial system and not about things like, you know, your, your sustainable development or your, your further um, societal development. So I think it's not unfair to say that the case of the IMF shows that IOs can often be agents against change. So they can be agents that stabilize a particular uh, international order and that they uh, give precedence to the interests of economically powerful states of the global north. Doesn't mean that all organizations do that, but it's certainly fair to say this about some international organizations. Now, let's come to the last case and then we'll wrap this up in just a second. So we could ask, how much power do IOs really have? I already alluded to this in the first case, right? Does the UN ever really do anything or is it always the states acting inside the UN and the UN itself can't really coerce states to do anything? Well, let's look at the International Criminal Court, the ICC. It's again a fairly recent organization. It's only about two decades old, even though maybe to you it sounds like it's an older thing. It is based on something, something called the Rome Statute, which is, which is an international treaty negotiated within the UN, but the ICC is not a UN organ. It stands in a tradition of international law that goes back all the way to the Second World War. You know, we have, and before that, we have things like the Geneva Convention that regulates what states are allowed to do in war times. Um, we had the Nuremberg trials as the outcome of the Second World War, where Nazis and other world war criminals were convicted and sentenced. And we had a number of ad hoc tribunals in the 90s that dealt with like the war in former Yugoslavia and the genocide in Rwanda, and to try to bring to justice those responsible for those crimes. But it was also... Um, it became clear in the second part of the 20th century that uh, bringing to justice those responsible for particularly heinous crimes wasn't an easy task. In fact, between Admiral Karl Dönitz of the German Navy in 1946 and the Liberian uh, General Charles Taylor in 2012, not a single head of state or government was convicted by an international tribunal. So basically 60 years of um, more or less uh, any head of government uh, getting off scot-free for whatever they did while they were um, in power. So it became clear that that wasn't a state of affairs that the world was uh, willing to tolerate. So 123 states as of this year have ratified this Rome statute and have created this international court. Um, and it has jurisdiction only about a specific type of crime. The only four types of crimes that the ICC investigates are genocide, so um, you uh, killing a certain ethnic groups of killing large numbers of civilians, crimes against humanity, things like forced disappearances, torture, um, uh, war crimes is the third category, so things like killing prisoners of war or uh, using mustard gas or other uh, chemical agents, using child soldiers, all that falls under that. And then you have crimes of aggression, which could be things like um, starting a war against a neighboring state, which is outlawed under the UN Charter. You're not allowed to do that. Um, and the ICC will also investigate you if you are instigating these kind of things as a head of state. The ICC has 18 judges, so it's a nice big, you know, like a, like a nice big courtroom uh, where the judges preside and where individuals can be convicted. Now, this is really interesting because most international law actually applies to states, not to individuals. But the International Criminal Court is an international organization that can drag you as an individual private person in front of it and sentence you and put you into prison. It's a pretty interesting concept and a new one at the time. So um, what then does that mean? It's independent. Um, so it's not. Oh, sorry about that. So the ICC is independent. It is not a UN organ, but the UN Security Council can refer cases to it. States can also bring cases in front of the ICC and the ICC's prosecutors can themselves initiate investigations in specific cases. So there's a number of ways in which you as an individual, if you've committed any war crimes recently, can end up in front of the ICC. 
Now, there's a frequent criticism I just want to get out of the way, and that is that the ICC exists to punish developing countries, because so far the vast majority of cases come from developing countries, almost all of them from Africa. So most of the criminals in front of the, or the alleged criminals in front of the ICC have been Africans, with some coming from um, Asia. But so there's a couple of more fundamental problems actually with the ICC that I want to cover, uh, because I think the, the, the first bit is a little bit unfair, um, even though it is empirically true. The first one is the lack of universal ratification. So many, many states, is, including those suspected of crimes that would fall under the ICC's jurisdiction, haven't ratified the court. Um, you know, this includes states like the US, uh, Turkey, um, Belarus, China, India, Pakistan, Russia, um, Sudan, Somalia, tons of others. Uh, that where individuals could well have ended up in front of the ICC, but they haven't ratified the charter, so they're not a part of the ICC's proceedings. There's also a distinct lack of enforcement mechanisms. So the ICC, of course, doesn't have its own police that can just turn up in a member state and arrest someone. They must rely on the member states themselves to enforce its mandates. So, of course, like lots and lots of war criminals don't just want to fly to the Netherlands and The Hague to get sentenced to prison for the rest of their life. They need to be apprehended, and the ICC needs member states to do that, but oftentimes that doesn't necessarily happen. And the deeper problem with why that doesn't happen is that there is no real sanctioning mechanism for either its own member states, but also for states that haven't ratified the statute. So you can basically just ignore what the ICC is doing as a state. The most famous case in recent times was Omar al-Bashir, the former leader of Sudan. Now, um, al-Bashir was accused to, of multiple crimes in the Darfur region, is, um, uh, especially, and the ICC opened its case in 2009. So that was 13 years ago. But then... Um, for the next decade, al-Bashir traveled to, and I'm going to read this off because it's a long list of countries, over the next 10 odd years, al-Bashir visited China, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, the United Emirates, Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Qatar, all without any of these states apprehending him and bringing him uh, in front of the ICC. Only in 2020, so last year, has Sudan itself committed to actually delivering uh, al-Bashir to the ICC under certain conditions. But for the majority of the early 2000s, al-Bashir basically could just walk around anywhere he wanted and go anywhere without any repercussions. I believe he also went to South Africa at some point and wasn't arrested, even though South Africa is a member of the ICC. Uh, so that's a blatant breaking of ICC rules. So um, we see here that even an international organization that seems to have such a uncontroversial set of aims, which is to prosecute those that commit, you know, heinous crimes against humanity, even such an organization often has trouble exerting its power because it can't really force its states to do much. So, Okay, with all these uh, cases, and this is already a fairly long lecture, so I'm going to bring it to a conclusion here. With all these cases, we've seen a number of things. So the first is, the first point I want to drive home is that IOs are a key part of the international system ever since the 19th century. They're not a new thing. But because situations of interdependence have increased in number, there's been more and more international organizations on the international level that are there to institutionalize cooperation and solve problems. And while IOs have achieved a great deal, all the way from, you know, the UN protecting international peace and security, at least arguably for a long time, uh, to the Global Fund uh, fighting against infectious diseases, a lot of aspects of IOs must be problematized and are being problematized in the relevant literature. So the first question is, you know, should we consider IOs as actors or arenas? The answer to that is they're probably a bit of both. I'm not sure if you found either of these arguments particularly convincing that I made on that slide, or either of these arguments to apply exclusively uh, instead of the other. Do, does the world generally follow a Western template? We can confidently say that it doesn't. There is a lot more ways in which international organizations are organized than just uh, how they are in the West. 
we sh probably shouldn't be exclusively focused on state-led IOs, not only because there is international non-governmental organizations, but more importantly, because there seems to be uh, an emergence of structures where non-state actors and state actors share decision-making powers. Do IOs create unequal global structures? Yep, we probably say so. And there's also plenty of um, IOs, especially in global trade, that seem to be much more concerned with stabilizing a existing unequal system than they are of really addressing the fundamental inequalities inherent in the system. And then lastly, as we've seen in the case of the ICC, can IOs truly exert power over states? Well, maybe, right? I mean, we could point to the ICC as, as an organization that has struggled to have states follow its rules, but maybe we can also think about other organizations like the EU, for example, that seems to be fairly good at compelling states to follow the rules and regulations that it makes. Now, the deeper question here of why there are these problems with international organizations and why there is a certain variation, why some seem to be better at their job than others, and why different things happen in different, very, uh, in different situations, that is very much the job of PRR1B, which we'll see next semester. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention so far through the course. Thank you for your patience of staying with us. Thank you for all your inputs and your participation on the course and the live streams. We hope that you'll have a great exam and we'll see you again after the, the winter holiday break. So until then, cheers, uh, see you then and thank you.